I'm back. So we can continue with Ace Attorney. Getting closer to the end here. Relax, sit back, and enjoy the drama of lawyering in ye old England. So, but as I mentioned, we are getting close to the end of this here, but so this is probably the pentultimate part of this, at least of at, at the Ace Attorney Adventures. Uh, after this is Resolve. Now I'm already thinking that I'm probably just going to go ahead and do Resolve on my own. Uh, since I feel like I've been playing this game for like, I think it's almost been two months I've been playing this off and on. And it just feels like it's taking a long time, so... And besides, I kind of want to play some other games for for streaming, especially for now that Spooktober is coming up here. So I'm going to do my Spooktober games next month mostly, for the most part. And then I have Metroid after that, whenever I get to uh, get to it. Anyway, let's uh, begin. We are still in the trial. Uh, what did we do last time? Oh, they're gonna try and bring in Mr. Eggs Benedict. That's right. Mr. Eggs Benedict is um, going to be summoned. <clears throat> ah, Gina! How are you holding up? I'm starting to feel quite warmly towards her frequent cold shoulders now. Kenny! Are you alright? Why, why aren't you saying anything? Did you go mute? Sorry, I was just looking back. I had like a new button on OBS I didn't see before. It's like, oh, oh, there's actually a share button on OBS. I didn't... <laughs> I didn't see that before. Maybe I should make use of that sometime. Maybe. We'll see. M maybe next time. Anyway. I got, got distracted, sorry. What's the point, eh? Why go to all this trouble and fight so hard for the likes of me? What? Well, you saw it. That picture. What picture? Mianosuke, why are you playing dumb? Even I remember the picture. Ah, you mean this? That photograph taken by Hurley's red-handed recorder? Well, I didn't think it would have captured scenes like this, that's for sure. Oh, wrong voice. <laughs> well, I didn't think it would have captured a scene like this, that's for sure. It's hopeless. Anyway, she's not gonna think I did, didn't they? Ain't they? Well, I won't pretend it was a bit of a shock when the prosecution first present presented it and presented it to the court. Sure, you gotta have your doubts about me now. You can't think I'm innocent. Still can't think I'm innocent. Of course I can. Kini, why don't you talk to us? Tell us what really happened that night. Eh? Eh? Muno has cleverly managed to piece together a lot of new information, but still. We'd really like to hear it from you. Alright then. It was after we'd had a dinner together at your place. Right, Iris? Then we all had shut up in your office, didn't we? Yes, I remember. Oh, 
After that, I couldn't get to sleep. So I slipped out and went down the street to 2 to 1, to Winnie Bank's place. And I didn't, I didn't know. If I asked the story, if I asked the story was there or not, the Hound of the Baskervilles. I don't know what it's about or nothing. But if you ask me, there's something in that Sholmes that don't like. Something Woody don't want people reading. So that's why he lied to Iris about sticking in love with Windy Bank for safekeeping. At least that's what I thought at the time. So you broke into Windy Banks. I just had to know if he was there or not. I mean, I had no idea that all that was going to kick off, did I? I struck my lock and stuck inside. It was dark as you like in there. So I gave the oil lamp on the counter a bit of wick, and that's when... What do you think you're doing? Arr. I know he died, I did. The next thing I knew... I grabbed the gun off the counter. I was waving it in the air like, I don't know what. Ah, uh, you're, you're the girl who was in here this afternoon. I didn't think pickpockets went in for armed robbery. The, the mantle script. Have you got it here? Did Sean leave a little paper with you? A story? I beg your pardon. The hound would up something or other. If it's here, I want to see it. I'm sorry, young lady. But I'd sooner die than relinquish an article belonging to one of my customers. Actually, I can't do that because you have my gun. If you could only please aim it at my head and shoot me in the head, that would be really convenient for me. I don't want it. What would I do with it anyway? I just want to see us there, that's all. Oh, you want to see it, do you? I want to know if Shulm's really pawned it here or not. Please, just let me see it and I'll go. Oh, very well then. But for pity's sake, stop waving my gun around, would you? So then the old cove unlocked the storm door, and we both went inside. And it was there, all right. The mantle script. Sholmes weren't lying after all. You did all that just to check for me, Guinea? Anyway, then there was a bit of a kick-up out in the main bit of the shop. Skulkin Brothers arriving on the Skulkin Brothers arriving on the scene, yes. What was that noise? Someone's breaking in. Hear me. Is there some burglars convention here tonight that I don't know about? I think I forgot to shut the door behind me. Sorry. Better go take care of it. Could I possibly have my gun back? Oh. Well, I'll come with you and... Now, don't be foolish, young girl. You must stay right here. Don't leave this room under any circumstances. And with that, he took the gun out of my hands and walked back out into the shop. And I'm back in the storeroom, like he said, straining my ears in the dark to hear what was going on. It sounded like they got into a bit of a scrap. I started to think I should help, see? So I was just about to go out to a storeroom myself when... Bang, bang. I heard a couple of shots go off. Two, I think. Almost at the same time. And then there was... A right at my feet. Lying face down on the floor. I was right next to the storeroom door so I slammed it shut and locked it as quick as, quick as you like. Because you thought whoever had shot Mr. Winniebank might come for you. Yeah, so I went and grabbed the old cove's gun. I figured I'd put up a fight at least. When I got a better look at him, I knew. Winnie Bank was a goner. Felt funny in me head all of a sudden. Kinda dizzy. And after that, I don't remember nothing. That must be when you passed out, Gina. 
if if I hadn't done what I'd done, the old cove might still be alive. Did you tell the police everything you told us? Of course I did, but they didn't believe a word of it, did they? All they said was, if I kept telling lies, it'd make things even worse for me. It'll be alright, Guinea. Don't worry. Just stay a little stronger. Luna was about to put the real culprit through the mill. That cold what from what was there in the afternoon? That eager Benedict. I still remember how he looked at me. Like I was nothing. He was there that night. We don't know his real name yet. But I'm convinced that he's involved somehow. I'm pretty sure he's not really named Eggs Benedict. That's that's the name of the dish, so we'll we'll, we'll find out what his we'll find out his real name is like Prime Rib. <laughs> Actually no no no. We know what his real name is. His, his real name is Beef Wellington. Yes, my name is Beef Wellington. Actually, I don't really know at all. Anyway, thank you for telling us what happened, Gina. I appreciate your honesty. You what? You can leave it on Reno's capable hands now, Guinea. Mr. Nara Odo. Yes? How come you trust me? I don't get it. I mean, have you, have you forgotten what happened here before? Come on, it was only two months ago. Me and McGilded. We told you the whole pack of lies. And you got the bug trotting off with him, even though he was a killer. No, I could never forget that. Thanks for reminding me of that game. <laughs> oh. I did what I thought was best at the time. But the pain of that error of judgment doesn't get any easier to bear. Still, don't forget that I also made you a promise. I told you that I'd be on your side to the bitter end, no matter what. But what if I'm lying? You could be walking to get another killer off the hook for all you know. Do, do, do you want to be found guilty? <laughs> I was once in your position, Gina. I was the accused in a trial. Technically kind of twice now, but... Yeah. You were. Before I left Japan, I was accused of murder. And strange as it might sound, the circum circumstances of this crime were pretty damning. I was sure that no one would believe it was it wasn't me who done it. Oh Runo. But there was one person who stood up for me, who believed in me and was prepared to defend me. That person was me. I defended myself in court. <laughs> I only have myself to count on. That's right. My and my best friend helped out a little bit too. <laughs> you know, Sake, no one believes you more than I do. Leave this to me. All you need to do is put your faith in me, and I'll do the rest. I was so happy. I cried. I was so happy I cried! <laughs> but even. Oh, was that Ryanosuke who said. I don't know. But even then, somewhere inside me, I couldn't help thinking. Surely he doesn't really believe in me. Not completely. But I was wrong. I was dead wrong. As soon as my trial began, it was obvious that he had an absolute unwavering belief in me. And in turn, I developed an absolute, unwavering belief in him.
Since then, I came to realize... If you want someone to believe in you, you have to believe in the other person first. What are you saying? I promise you, Gina, that no matter what happens, I'll keep believing in you. So you don't need to worry. I won't let you down. Even though I'm a diver, and a no-good liar. You're not like McGilded. I know that. Eh? That's right, you're a friend, Guinea. Iris, why'd you yell at me? We know you better than you think. We've come to, come to the conclusion that you're someone we can trust. Yes. Yes. That's really all we need to know. The power of friendship. Exactly. Um, Mr. Naruto, I, I am, I... That, that wasn't the sniffle I was going for. But we'll, we'll just pretend that's what actually happened. <laughs> I found in the late game I saw in the League of Representatives. Copper saying you're about to go. Please hand you the car room immediately. Yes, of course. Thank you. It's time to continue. I've been both a defendant and a, de and a defending lawyer in my time, so I knew only too well just how hard it was to put all your faith in another. And I also knew just how hard it was to bear the burden of another, another putting all their faith in you. This is it at last. The final chapter. The final battle. Wish me luck, Suzato Sama, and I hope you're watching me with me too. Partner. Back to the courtroom. Meanwhile, I'm back in the old Bailey courtroom. I hereby call this court to order. As you resume the trial of Miss Gina Lestrade. Lord Van Zeeks, have you successfully subpoenaed the witness? The subpoena was delivered to the communications station where the man walks immediately, my lord. However, the heavy rain has delayed the arrival of this carriage, it would seem. Hmm, I see. Let us turn our attention to Inspector Gregson's presses of the case heard by the court this morning. The glaring omission of the third bullet in your report is a serious blunder, Inspector. Yes, um, I can only apologize, my lord. And although the defense's chemical analysis of the blood at the scene makes for a compelling argument, I cannot permit such untried methods to be used as evidence in my courtroom. Hmm. It's a big mistake to crush Hurley and me. Very big mistake. Don't, 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 don't talk to to a judge that way. That's that doesn't usually go over well. <laughs> My lord, the subpoena witness has just arrived in the building. Thank you, officer. Show him to the stand without delay. Mister Eggs Benedict, Eggs e Benedict. I didn't expect to be crossing paths with him again so soon. And certainly not like this. Thank you for complying with the court's subpoena at such, such short notice, sir. But of course, my lord. As an upstanding member of London society, it is my pleasure to oblige. Now, kindly state your name and occupation for the record. Ashley Graydon, communications officer. 
Mr. Crane and I both work at London Central Communications Station. Now perhaps somebody would kindly explain what all this is about. You were apprised of the situation by the court officer on your way here, I presume? Yes, I was. Something to do with a murder that took place at a pawnbroker's on Baker Street. And some nonsense about me having been there on the night in question. That is the accusation, indeed. This really is beyond a joke, you know. Very well. Without further delay, the court will hear your testimony now, Mr. Graydon. You will respond to the accusation made against you under oath. Do a little dance, do a little jug. Gladly, my lord. Gladly. Alright. Testimony time. Our favorite time. Naturally, I have, I have occasion to make use of pawnbroking services from time to time. Uh, let's see, this is great. Let me just write that down. You just pawn brokers, okay. But are you seriously suggesting I colluded with these thugs to break into the place on the night of the murder? I have no intention of admitting to such, out, such an outrageous accusation. Not admit. Okay. Even if certain parties here present claim that my blood was found at the scene. Some scar... scar some scaramouch detectives homebrewed tincture can hardly be taken as a serious evidence. Okay. That's the veracity of, you know, the blood test thing, whatever. Okay. So, you deny the accusation completely, do you? I must say, I am dismayed. For the highest court in the land to be swayed by this self-professed detective's toy? It was the will of the jury, and our great British justice system demands that the jury's will is upheld. And then it would seem we have the misfortune of a most inept assembly of jurors today. By golly! How long am I expected to be detained here? If, following the defense's cross-examination, your involvement in this matter has not been established, you will be free to leave immediately. Good. Then I shall be away in time for afternoon tea. Some small consolation, at least. Let us not hold up Mr. Graydon any longer than necessary, counsel. Proceed with the cross-examination. So, we meet again, Mr. Eggs Benedict. Or is it Mr. Graydon? My apologies. You are? Ryunosuke Narohodo, defense lawyer. We have met. If you say so, Ashley Graydon, unshot. So, Uh, excuse me? <laughs> I trust we can, can conclude this quickly. Uh, but I'm not holding your flashy white hat while we do so. Alright. Alright, let's just uh, press him on Hold stuff it! and get some information. Yeah, I'll keep him here as long as I want to. Yes, we even met in the pawnbrokery where the crime took place on the afternoon of the day in question. 
Though, of course, you introduced yourself by a different name at the time. It was Mr. Egert Benedict, I believe. Objection! N the witness is here to testify about events that took place on that night. He is under no obligation to answer such unrelated questions. You can't be serious. Thank you, because I certainly do not feel inclined to answer such an inappropriate question. So he's going to be evasive, is he? In an effort not to give anything away. This could be tricky. Have you seen these two men before? This pair? No, I don't associate with criminals. Said by a man who introduced himself as Eggs Benedict. I'd like to know who I have to thank for this. Who made this outlandish accusation against me? The young lawyer there in the black. This is a farce. Do my, do my farce dance. Whose idea was it to permit an outsider to work in a British court anyway? Uh, the Lord Chief Justice, dude? Well, needless to say. Where were you around one in the morning on the night in question, sir? That is past the hour at which I would normally retire. Certainly. I was not in the company of these rapscallions. You're able to prove that? Objection! Object, yeah. Listen carefully, my learned Nipponese friend. For you appear to be under a gross misapprehension on this point. The witness does not have to prove things. It is up to the prosecution and the defense to prove things, not the witness. <laughs> what do you mean? The witness... Ugh. The witness maintains he was not at the scene of the crime. He has no obligation to prove his absence. If your accusation is that the witness was present at the scene, the obligation lies with you to prove your assertion. Which is correct, yes. You will fulfill that obligation before putting any more unreasonable questions to the witness. Do my jiggy dance. Silent victory wiggle, thanks. Hold it! Blood was found at the scene of the crime. There's no question of that. Mr. Scholz's chemical analysis has positively identified the substance as such. But I am not the only human to have blood running through my veins, am I? How can you be sure that the blood is mine? It could equally be the blood of one of these two miscreants. Every individual's blood has a slightly different composition, it seems. Mr. Scholz's chemical is able to differentiate between... Spare me the science lesson. Who is this Sholmes character anyway? Oh, I I assumed all Londoners would know the name. He's a great, well, a renowned detective. So even you are unable to bring yourself to say, great detective. A great detective, you say? Just now we're in the realm of fairy tales, are we? Ooh, what do we got going on here? Excuse me! Do you have something to say about that, Mr. Skulkin? Eh, what? Me? 
You know, the Mr. Skulkin next to you. The tall one. Right, I've had up to hear of this. How many times do I gotta tell you? We weren't, we weren't talking to you, Mr. Fish and Chips. Yes, I know, you're not Big Bro Skulky. You're Inspector Fish and Chips. <laughs> Mr. Nash Skulkin. Eh? Of course, blame me, Governor. Will you what? Is it not the case that when Mr. Graydon just spoke, a thought went through your mind? Would you care to share that thought with the court? Eh, me thoughts. I don't have none of them. It must have been him. You what? Mr. Nash Skulkin, answer the question, please. What went through your mind when Mr. Graydon just spoke? Nothing. Honest, Gov, nothing. I was just thinking. If he waves his arm around like that much more, it'll open up the wound again. That's all. Oh. What wound would that be? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what wound? Tell me more. Tell me more about this wound. Well, I took the bullet, of course. It was only two days ago. It ain't gonna be healed up yet. So it was, um, well, you know, uh, it was ruined for him, and, um... Oh, El Bells. Mr. Graydon, did you hear that? What? Your comrade is worried about you, it seems. On account of your injured arm. My lord. Yes, Mr. Graydon? I have no idea what these two wretches are talking about. Certainly, I shouldn't be expected to answer anything in relation to their mindless insinuations. Hmm. We know that someone other than the victim was hit by a bullet at the scene of the crime two nights ago. And from the height of the bullet hole in the, bo in the wall, that person was likely hit in the upper arm or thereabouts. Perhaps you'd allow a court official to examine your arm, sir? The left arm that you're currently clasping with your right hand as if in pain. No, I refuse. You have shown no evidence whatsoever that links me to these common feeds. Accordingly, I am not obliged to permit any such invasion of my privacy. He's pulling the, um, trying to pull the uh, Von Karma defense here. <laughs> You will not look at my bullet in my, my shoulder. As I've already said, I'm completely uninvolved in all of this. I never had anything to do with the pawnbrokery where this fellow was killed whatsoever. I take offense at the insinuation, but I was in any way involved. Hmm. You claim to have had nothing whatsoever to do with Mr. Winniebank's pawnbrokery. My lord. The defense would like that last statement to be added to Mr. Graydon's formal testimony. Very well, counsel. Continue with your testimony, Mr. Graydon. The bottom line is, I've never had anything to do with the pawnbroking establishment where the man was killed. That's uh, that word has come up before. 
That's just what Lord showed me now. Okay. I just wonder if there's something else there. So communication, so yeah, there could be a link to like Mr. Mr. Eggs here. I'm sorry, Mr. Grayson. His name is Mr. Grayson now. The question is, do we have anything that can actually prove this? Hold Let's it. just press him for now, see what we get. Never had anything to do with it. You forget that I was there, Mr. Graydon, on the very afternoon of the incident. Obviously, I am not a complete stranger to the pawnbrokers. I'm currently on the lookout for an armchair to furnish my study. Objection. No. You were there to redeem an article. I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, but I think the inspector remembers. Excuse me. Do you have something to add, inspector? Yeah. Come again, sunshine. You were there too, in fact, weren't you too? Weren't you, inspector, that afternoon? Well, yes, I do remember meeting yourself in the pawnbrokers that afternoon. You, your young Japanese assistant, and the accused were all present at that present, as I recall. And at that time, th this witness, Mr. Graydon, was trying to acquire a particular article. Um, well, now. Don't, don't be shy, Mr. Fish and Chips. Come on. I'm afraid I don't remember it too clearly. Nani? But, but you must. I'm not going to lie and pretend I remember something that I don't. What's going on here? Gregsy showed us a picture before, didn't he? You know, from the cameras that's really installed in Winniebanks. Yes, of course. Indeed. And the gentleman pictured bears a striking resemblance to the witness, I must say. Oh, yeah, we have that picture. Wait, do we? Exactly, which proves that, that Mr. Graydon was in the shop on the afternoon in question. At no point have I denied that fact. I merely entered the shop to peruse the articles on sale and have a word with the broker. Nothing more. Come on, Inspector Fish and Chips. Why, 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 why are you doing it? Why are you doing this to me? This makes no sense. I understand why Mr. Graydon might be trying to cover his tracks, but why would Gregson be trying to avoid giving testimony about what happened? That's all he's going to say on the matter, is it? What do you think, Runo? I think he has no intention of telling us anything. He's well aware that the less he says, the less chance he has of give giving himself away. Hmm. The complete opposite of Hurley, then. He seems to think that the more he says, the better. Well, at least I managed to prize a little, bit, little more information from these witnesses' lips. All thanks to the Skulkin brothers. Yes, they were the key to it after all. So he says he had nothing to do with Winnie Banks. Well, we know that's not true. Perhaps now would be a good time to have a proper look through the court record. Good idea. You never know what tiny scrap of information could become a valuable weapon. Okay, let me just review what he has here. I don't think we pressed him on this. Hold it! Don't forget, sir, that Mr. Herlock Sholmes is the most famous detective in the world. That we know of. 
and the most famous detective in the world tells the truth. The whole truth, and nothing but the truth, hmm? Um, well, um... No, I can't think of how to answer that. I once saw the world's most famous swindler thrown into jail. He allegedly told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but what turned out to be a pack of lies. Ugh. Quite. Now, as you are no doubt aware, the central communication station is the heart of this country's information network. My work there is, is of paramount importance, and you have kept me from it long enough already. Well, I never had anything to do with the pawnbroking establishment where the man was killed. Safety save here. Um. All right, let's take a look at what I got here. So this is the one small box. Now, which was the ticket that one? Let's say overcoat. Okay, so this was the ticket that Gina brought in, and it was the ticket that um, Graydon claims that Gina stole from him. So he came into the establishment after her to try and get the coat, claiming this was his ticket that he knew the secret password for this, which I don't remember off the top of my head what it was. Um, okay, so as much as this proves that Mr. Benedict was there, the court's not going to accept this as evidence, so I don't think it's worth trying to present that. He was there to get the music disc. I don't think this would help me at all. No. Ah, I still don't know why we have this in the evidence. I don't know what the basket bills, it doesn't really. Yeah. Mr. Benedict's fingertip. After the Winnie Banks. Mm, I wonder if this would be enough. Because I don't think there's really anything else. Because I don't actually have the photo of Benedict in the store. Um, alright, let's see. I'm looking at a man who's killed. Alright, let me try this, see if that works and does anything. Objection! Okay, it did. Have you ever seen this disc before, Mr. Graydon? 
Why? Is it supposed to mean something? This disc was until the day of the murder in pawn in Mr. Winniebank's shop. It was redeemed by the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade, that afternoon. However, somebody mysteriously appeared to try and take it from her. And that somebody was you, of course. Wasn't it, Mr. Graydon? As I have reiterated numerous times now, you are mistaken. That was not me. I have never seen that disc before in my life. It may have escaped your notice, but there is a small smear of blood on the disc. Ah, yes. Resulting from an abrasion of the thumb, it, thumb perhaps. That's right. The surface of the disc is covered in hundreds of tiny metal bumps. In the skirmish to acquire the disc, the thumb of the person who tried to take it suffered minor lacerations. So, while well, the disc bears the remnants of that skirmish in the form of this smear of blood, the thumb of the person in question must bear the remnants also in the form of a scratch. Good gracious, indeed it must. Mr. Graydon, you refuse to allow a court officer to examine your arm before. Are you now going to refuse, uh, refuse to allow us to examine your thumb? Well, that depends on which thumb you're talking about. Because I have no doubt that it bears a small scratch consistent with the smear of blood on this disc. Well, well. It would seem I underestimated you. What, what is the meaning of this? So you admit it now? You admit you have a scratch on your thumb? from when you attempted to take the disc from the defendant? Well, ha, ha. You assume that I have a thumb. But look, I have no thumbs. I chopped both my thumbs off, so you can't prove anything. I win. Order! Order! Well, Mr. Graydon? It would appear there has been something of a misunderstanding here. I did not attempt to take the disc, as you put it. No, quite the reverse. What are you trying to say? Do my den. It's really quite simple, you see. The disc was mine from the outset. Is there some crime in taking an item that you own out of pawn? Nani? It would seem, Mr. Graydon. That in this piece of evidence, my learned friend has established a link between yourself and the incident. Accordingly, you will tell the court everything you know about this disc now. As you wish. Though I'm quite sure it has nothing whatsoever to do with the pawnbroker's murder. Making progress. Okay. There's a note on the disc saying, for McGilded, but the item belongs to me. The redemption ticket was stolen from me by the accused, that filthy gutterling on the day in question. I proceeded at once to the shop in order to explain my situation and redeem my article. Okay. In the end, of course, the disc was taken by the police. In other words, I had absolutely no reason to break into the shop later that same night. I mean, that does generally match up with what, what happened, or at least his explanation of what happened. Did 
Did I hear you correctly, sir? Nick Gilded, you say? The famous London ph philanthropist? Who perished in this very courtroom two months ago after being acquitted of a distinctly messy murder? Yes, my lord. The one and the same. Good lord. Mr. Graydon. Are you saying that Mr. McGilder and yourself were acquainted? Yes, that's correct. Poor door. Well, certainly didn't expect to hear that name uttered here in my courtroom again. According to what Gina told us, this disc was placed in pawn on that fateful night two months ago. McGill himself gave instructions to deposit it at Windybanks. It's funny that Mr. Graydon here is claiming the disc belongs to him, then, isn't it? In all likelihood, he's lying. So he appeared so he appeared that afternoon at Winniebanks in order to get his hands on Nick Gilded's disc for some reason. Counsel, we will commence your cross-examination, please. Gladly. Hold it! Hold it. Would you care to explain how this item belongs to you? As you will observe, a communications officer such as myself commands a fine salary. You are certainly exquisitely dressed, sir. So you see, I have little need to make use of the services provided by the pawnbrokery trade. However, I did once find myself in difficulties having misplaced my purse while on an errand. Which is why I pawned my fine black overcoat to the broker in question. You claim that was your... that was your overcoat. Obviously, and in my haste I clean forgot that the music box disc was in, was in its pocket. And yet, there is a note on it that reads, For McGilded. I am a collector of rare and unusual music box music. But believe me, I am. At, I first met Mr. McGilded at a gentleman's club in the city, and was interested to discover that he shared my penchant in that area. So, the disc in question... It's a pre-production sample. I promise to let Mr. McGilded hear it. But then you forgot that it was in the pocket of the overcoat that you were forced to pawn. Yes, exactly. Gina didn't mention any of that in her testimony two months ago, did she? No, because Mr. McGill had threatened, to, had threatened her to keep her mouth shut. Which means that if we dig too deeply here, it's going to expose Gina's perjury. Oh, okay, so I guess we gotta watch out for that. Oh dear, this is this has now become more complicated, isn't it? Let's leave it alone for the time being. You know, in that case, I probably will make a safety save. Just in case there is like a, a trap set in here somewhere, which, which is not unheard of in Ace Attorney. Especially in the final cases, sometimes there's a little trap set. When you press or, or try to present evidence. So you're saying that Miss Lestra lifted the ticket from your pocket or bag? That's right. Despite being mindful of danger when walking in the insablerous areas, her crying frequent. Objection! Miss Lestra did no such thing. We, we, we can't prove that, Rianoska. Well, of course you would take that stance, but the girl is a regular offender. You came to the pawnbrokery that day prepared with all the information you needed to identify the defendant. You were looking for her. That's what brought you to Winniebanks. To, 
get your hands on Mr. McGilded's disc. Objection! My learned friend has a veritable font of nonsense. N nonsense? I concur with the prosecution. Counsel, you will refrain from conjecturing in this way. Is that clear? Yes, my lord. Then I will continue with my testimony, for what possible use it can be. Hold it! Had you ever been to Win Winnie Banks before? Only once for the purpose of uh, purposes of pawning something. But like many, I enjoy browsing in such establishments. So when you noticed that the pickpocket had taken your ticket, you chased after her. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. I didn't notice at first, of course. Such is the art of the pick purse. But when I did, I headed to the pawnbrokery at once in order to reclaim my coat before the thief could. I was merely trying to recover what was rightfully mine in the first place. Ah, he can say what he likes because he knows we have no evidence to contradict him on this. Hold it! Yes, it was taken by Inspector Gregson here, wasn't it? Wasn't it? That's right, this was the very man. Apparently, the police are collecting anything that has a connection to Mr. McGilded right? as evidence. W would you like to explain that, Fish and Chips? Excuse me. Is something wrong, Inspector? Um, well, um, what do you mean? The last remark Mr. Graydon made in his testimony seemed to trouble you in some way. Eh, no, no it didn't. It's nothing. Leave it alone. Let me ask you this, Inspector. Why is Scotland Yard gathering Mr. McGilded's possessions? I can't tell you something like that, Sunshine. What is it, Inspector? Investigative secrets? Yes, exactly. You should know all about that. Magnus McGilded who died so unexpectedly after his trial two months ago. A man renowned throughout the capital for his great contributions to public life. Yet he had a dark side, too. Where are you going with this, Van Zeeks? I suppose the police are dealing with the aftermath of his nefarious activities, are they? That's enough. Coppers like me are duties to carry out that we're not at liberty to talk about. That's all you need to know. Duty is conferred by Lord Strongheart, I presume. The Lord Chief Justice appears to have a great faith in you, Inspector. The bottom line is, if you want to get more out of me, you're going to need Lord Strongheart's paw print first. What's all this about? It's like there's something going on between Gregson and Lord Van Zeeks here. Well, it would appear that the Inspector has revealed all he is at liberty to reveal. Mr. Graydon, let's return to your testimony. Gladly, my lord. Hold it! But perhaps you'd seen something of value among the forfeited items. Objection, that is just pure speculation. <laughs> no, not at all. Oh. A valuer was brought in by the police to assess everything in the shop. Without exception, every article on the shelf was common or garden bric-a-brac. In that case, it's clear that you broke into a shop later that day in order to recover Mr. McGill's disc. 
did did you forget what the last part of testimony was? We we just we just talked about this. He already was aware the police took the disc. Actually, come to think of it, why was he aware the police took the disc? Because he wasn't present when Gregson took the disc. So how did he know about that? Hmm. Interesting. I put like a little note tag on that. But have you not been listening, man? Even if I had wanted to recover the recover the disc, you may recall that it, that it had been seized by the police that afternoon. It was no more in the shop that night than I. As I keep saying, I simply had no reason to break in. But how did you know that? So there is nothing of McGill that's left in the shop that night. Nothing this man might have been after. I wonder if that's really true. You know, if you have some evidence, then let him have it. I'm dying to see that irritatingly assured expression of his crumble. McGill had slipped the disc into his coat pocket and had it deposited at Winniebanks. Then when he realized he was going to be arrested on suspicion of the omnibus murder, he threatened Gina and forced her to take the redemption ticket. There's no doubt about it. That witness is lying through his pearly white teeth. The police were obviously after anything left behind behind that left behind by McGilda as well. That's why Inspector Gregson ended up taking the disc into custody that day. But Gregson's being very strange about all this. There must be a reason for that, I'm sure. I just don't know what it is. For now, I need to focus on exposing the fact that Mr. Graydon is lying in his testimony. Like, I want to know how he knows the police acquired the disc. Because if I recall... Oh, I didn't mean to do that thing. Whatever. Yeah, whatever. So, if I can recall correctly, he had a gun. He was trying to forcefully take the disc from Gino when Gregson arrived, and then he fled the scene. And it was only after that Gregson acquired the disc. So again, it comes back to the question of how did he know the police had the disc? He probably didn't know, and he assumed it was still at the pawnbrokers. That, 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 that is the train of thought I'm kind of going on right now, and I just need to figure out a way to... What do I have that could prove that? Well, there's also the fact that Gina still has the jacket on her. So again, if he... If he didn't know the police took the disc, he would have to either presume the disc was still at the pawnbrokers or was still in the jacket that Gina has. That Gina had. It's 
explosion and redeem my work. See, see what he said here again. That's what the inspector said, at least, as he sees my disc. And thanks to the skirmish with that weasel, I snagged the end of my thumb at the same time. And the disc in question is this disc here. Yes, it is. Scotland Yard have indeed been gathering items believed to have been the property of the Gilded. Presumably to aid their investigations in some way. Not something I would be aware of. We well, didn't know the man well anyway. Ta-da! After all, I am merely a communications officer with a penchant for music boxes. And flamboyant poses. <clears throat> Hmm. All right, let's just take a chance here and see what we get. The photograph? Objection. Nope. Guessing it's representing the disc here. Objection. Nope, that didn't work. <laughs> <Zammy. laughs> uh, I'm not damn it, I'm not damn it. thinking that uh, but the uh, yeah but the pawnbroker is an idiot, idiot and doesn't put the names on these tickets so I can't really prove that hey it belonged to somebody else except that the blood on the ticket is from the mason dude of course, that doesn't count either. Well, I'm getting stumped. Uh, 
Alright. Alright, I'm just gonna look up what I'm supposed to do here, because I'm getting kind of lost here. To do that, I need to present the ticket. For the box on statement 5. Huh? I don't get that. Alright. Oh, oh, okay, whatever. Whoa. Doesn't make any sense to me, but... So... Okay, so I present the pawnbroker's ticket on statement 5, which is the last one. You know, there's absolutely no reason to break into... Wait, did he have the other ticket? I don't remember that. This ticket? Pawnbroker, you know, by the victim, Mr. He's been a problem with Mr. Winnie making the form of some handwritten notes on the back of a phone. Um, I don't understand by that. Objection. Okay. Some weird roundabout logic going on here. I don't really get. This disc was deposited at Winnie Banks on Magnus McGillard's instructions. You knew that, and you went there with the intention of obtaining it for yourself. Objection! Conjecture again. And in any case, the disc was taken into custody by the police that afternoon. And the witness had no reason to visit the pawnbroker again that night. Objection! Sorry, my learned friend, but that's not true. What? Mr. McGillard had another article in pawn at Winniebanks. As this, second pawnbroker's ticket proves. Ah. There were two articles belonging to Mr. McGillard in Winniebanks pawnbrokery. And the reason you broke into the shop that night was to recover was to recover the second one. Together with your two accomplices, the Skulkin brothers. Ah. Hmm. This is the second ticket, is it? What had the man deposited? The article description reads, One small box. A rather vague description, it seems to me. Are you suggesting that I broke into the pawn brokery with these clowns in order to steal some trinket box? I believe there are adequate grounds to suspect that you did. This is absurd. Why on earth would I do such a thing? Once the article had been forfeited, I could simply walk into the shop and purchase it. There would be absolutely no need for me to resort to theft. Actually, I wonder if the box is a music box. You know what it probably is. That's a good point. Hmm. Indeed. The witness makes a solid argument. So that means that for some reason... This Graydon fellow needed the small box that very night. Does it? Objection! It's time to put an end to this nonsense, my lord. Could you be a little less cryptic, Lord Van Zeeks? I do hate to ruin my learned friend's argument, but the truth is quite incontrovertible. On the night in question, no small box was taken from Windybank's pawnbrokery. And rest assured, the prosecution can prove it. What? Good gracious! Inspector, show the photographic prints to the court, if you please. Yes, sir. What prints? These prints were taken from one of the detective security cameras. Ah, Curly's red-handed records again. We just call them cameras, you know? Yeah. As previously explained using this plan of the shop layout, the victim's establishment was furnished with automatic cameras in two locations. 
One was set to capture the counter where Mr. Winniebank received his customers, and the other was set to capture the shelves on which articles were placed for sale once forfeited. According to the information this, you know, on this, blah. According to the information on this ticket, Nicola's small box had been forfeited already. Two days before the incident, at 9 p.m. on the 13th, 13th of April to be precise, which means it would have been on the shelves of forfeited items in the shop front. Now, what I have here is a print taken by one of the cameras about two hours before the incident. That's at 11 p.m. on the 15th of April. Hmm. The victim certainly did have a full shop, it would, it would appear. And then, here we have, no, uh, have another print. This one was taken about two hours after the incident. Let's see. So we have two pictures to compare. Oh, this place spot the difference. Though I must say, placing them side by side leaves me cold. I'm gonna play spot the difference here. We can see what's different here. Do you enjoy playing spot the difference? It'd be nice if my screen was like a little bigger here, but... Uh-oh. I see the murder weapon. It's the Thinker! There's a Thinker statue in there. I'm not really seeing anything immediately that looks different, though. Okay, I see there's one little thing. There was a tiny little box that moved to the, the right on one of the shelves in the picture frame. That's kind of close to where the, um, the, the big music box is. Okay. Dear me, that's starting to make my head ache. Obviously, at Scotland Yard, we considered theft as one possible motive in this case. We explored the possibility that something had been taken in addition to the victim's life. So your men have already compared these two prints thoroughly, Inspector. Yes, sir. We counted every single item in each of these two photographic prints. And the yard's conclusion is that exactly the same number are present in both. But are they in exactly the same spots, though? Are they? Are they, Inspector? Hmm. In other words, nothing was taken from the pawnbrokery on the night in question. And my learned friend's assertion is nothing more than a hopeful fantasy. Arr! I don't believe it. If I could have just shown that he'd stolen... M McGillard's pawn box. Do a little jig, my victory jig. I might have been able to break him down at last. You know what, Runo? I've been thinking. I wonder if these two photographs really are exactly the same. They're not. What? Time for more cross-eyes. Cross your eyes and let's, let's see. So, counsel, in the light of the evidence put forward by the prosecution, what is your position? Seems that, in fact, on the night in question, nothing was stolen from the victim's establishment. Do you accept the prosecution's assertion? No. There's still some explaining, explaining to do. No, no. Could there be some hidden discrepancy in these two photographic prints somewhere? Point something out here. I wasn't sure at first, but 
There is a clear discrepancy between these two prints. What? You must identify the location in question for the court, counsel. Indicate the precise location of the, of the discrepancy of which you speak. It's uh, this little box over here. Take that! Granted, these two prints are almost identical. Almost. However, there is one minor discrepancy between them. What? When you do view the two pictures stereoscopically, which I didn't do at all for this, <laughs> a single area stands out as being different. The location of this small box. Let me wait. Un unbelievable. By Jove, you're right. How extraordinary. <laughs> what this tells us is very simple. Mr. McGill's small box was indeed not stolen from Winnie Banks on the night in question. However, there can be no doubt that somebody picked up this particular box and then returned it to its place on the shelves. Are you suggesting that the small box originally deposited by Mr. McGillard is, in fact... Yes, the very same small box I just identified in those photographic prints. Objection! Mindless guesswork. What if it was... So a box was moved on the shelf. Nothing was stolen. Which means, quite simply, that nothing has changed. That... that may be true, but... Alright. The Gilded's box... the Gilded's box wasn't stolen then. But doesn't the fact that it was moved like that change things? Like, why was the box moved? I'm gonna say... Actually, I, sh I should be doing multiple saves. I don't know why I'm not doing that. Yeah, yeah, I'm finally doing my second save, finally. Well, I have to press forward. It changes everything. If I say nothing, I'm just gonna lose the case. <laughs> I believe this changes everything about the case. How can that possibly be? The crucial point is the fact that what was moved was a small box. In other words, we have to consider what might have been inside that box. What are you suggesting? I'm suggesting that we need to examine that box as soon as possible. A vital piece of that evidence is sitting on the shelves at Winniebanks as we speak. Objection! That won't be necessary. Some little box belonging to a man who died two months ago can't possibly be relevant to this trial. But we already got McGillard's name has come up several times already. The court does not uphold your objection, Lord Van Zeeks. Thank you. <laughs> Bailiff, arrange for an officer to go to Baker Street at once. Obtain the small box in question and bring it back here for a further examination. for the little box. We should have a report within half an hour. I think perhaps we should recess for a short while until the evidence is brought forth to be hoodwinked by such a farce. Hmm. Disappointing. I beg your pardon, Lord Van Zeeks. This is nothing but a smokescreen. A Nipponese specialty, it would seem. What are you trying to say? Are you talking smack about my country? 
My learned friend has persisted with the same line of reasoning from the very beginning. And that this witness's intent was to steal an article belonging to Mr. McGilded from the pawnbrokery. Yet common sense tells us that none of the articles have value enough to be worth stealing in the first place. Exactly. It would be beyond absurd to break into a place for the purpose of stealing such commonplace property. Hmm. If your lordship recalls, Mr. McGilded perished two months ago, immediately after the conclusion of his trial. A trial in which he was found not guilty. A trial in which it was established he was the upstanding member of society, his reputation implied, in fact. So I propose a toast to my learned friend and his most insightful defense. Yeah, he's just gonna try and rub it in Rinosuke's face. The articles this upstanding member of society pawned were entirely ordinary. A black overcoat that just happened to have a music box disc in one of its pockets, and a small box. I assure you, I wouldn't accept even if the man tried to make a gift of such things to me. Then why would you so insist on going to retrieve them from the pawnbroker? You know, that does make a lot of sense. It's not as if it's gold or jewels, is it? Though goodness knows Mr. McGill was rich enough. Bought you a crown to pause it. Do it. Yeah, you can't use poor people. Prosecution's argument is undeniably compelling. It is incumbent on the defense now to bolster its argument. To explain what possible significance these commonplace articles pawned by this fine citizen could have. Well, counsel, is your argument in fact demonstrable? He is calling you out, so you might want to, might want to buck up here. Are you able to show proof with the disc or the box, or in any tangible way related to related to this case? Well, um, and what's the matter, Runo? We know, but they're related, don't we? They're both vital pieces of evidence. Yes, of course. You and I both know that. We know McGilda's true character. And we know the disc is significant, even if we don't know why. If we explain all that to the court... But we'll explain all that to the court at this point. We'll have to acknowledge that McGilda's acquittal two months ago was a mistake. That defense's argument was flawed, based on false information. Oh no! And that would mean admitting that Gina com committed perjury. The Kitty! Could it be that Van Zeke's nose? Is that why he's doing this now? Because he anticipated everything? But maybe. This could be a great opportunity for us. Sorry? What do you mean, Iris? Well, what is it that you always say, Runo? Sooner or later, the truth comes out, every time. Oh, I, I, I say that? <laughs> I, I forgot. Alright, the exact significance of the things that Mr. that McGill deposited within Mr. Winniebanks is something that only Gina can explain to the court. But if I put her on the stand to testify about that, it could critically damage our chances of winning this case. What's the right thing to do here? Well, I think we have to move forward here, so... There's really not much else we can do, so have her justify. My lord, 
the defense would like to make a proposal. Oh, what proposal, counsel? While the court awaits the arrival of, of Mr. McGilded's small box, I would like to call the defendant, Ms. Gina Lestrade, to the witness stand. The defendant? To what end? It's to do with the various articles deposited at Money Banks by Mr. McGilded, my lord. Ms. Lestrade has information relating to them. I believe it would be beneficial for the court to hear what she has to say. It will prove the significance of the articles in question once and for all. Well, well. Things are becoming interesting. I presume you've considered the implications of the testimony you're proposing. In particular, the impact it will have on the accused, standing, and indeed your own. I have. Lord Van Zeeks, would you care to explain that last remark? Because I don't know about these things. The prosecution accepts the defense's proposal. I move to interrupt the cross-examination of the current witness and hear from the accused herself. Very well. If you have no objection. So the court will now hear of a testimony of the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade. The witnesses currently in the stand may step down until further notice. Then I shall bid you good day. Wait. You, sir, shall remain in the stand while Miss Lestrade testifies. As you wish. All right then, Gina. It's showtime. I know this will be hard, but please, put your faith in me here. Good luck, Runo. It's your idea, not mine. <clears throat> the articles that Mr. McGillard had deposited in Winnebank's pawnbrokery are intimately involved with the omnibus case, the trial of which was heard in this courtroom two months ago. Yes, and I remember this young lady being brought before me in that trial as well. That's right, my lord. Her testimony helped to establish the innocence of, of the defendant, Mr. McGilded. The omnibus case was intriguing, to say the least. And now, here we all are again, the same players in that trial facing each other once more. A twist of fate, perhaps, my Nipponese friend. Allow me to recap the events of two months ago. An old brickmaker was stabbed to death in an omnibus running along London's winter streets. <laughs> Apart from the victim, there was only one other person in the carriage, Mr. McGilded. Naturally, he was the prime suspect for the murder. But as the trial progressed, another possibility emerged. That the murder, in fact, took place above the defendant's head on the roof deck with the body then being dropped through the skylight into the carriage below. It was Mr. Strahd who, whose testimony brought that possibility to light. At the time of the incident, Miss Lestrade was concealed under a seat in the carriage, hoping to pick the pockets of unsuspecting passengers. And then immediately after the trial, having been acquitted of the murder, Mr. McGilded died in this very courtroom in the most extraordinary and gruesome of circumstances. A mystery that remains unsolved even now, two months on. As indeed does the omnibus murder itself. Be that as it may, I recall neither the disc nor the small box being mentioned in the court in the course of those proceedings. Miss Lestrade. 
Would you tell the court now, please? What really happened in the omnibus two months ago? I mean... Huh, I don't know what you mean. I already said all of what I know. And what about everything you told us yesterday from inside your prison cell? Please, Mr. Strahd. This is extremely important. But, but... Remember, little girl. If it transpires that you willfully withheld information in the trial two months ago, the Home Office will seek to prosecute you for perjury. And naturally, you will lose all credibility as a witness. Although, let's face facts. You have little credibility to lose. Kenny, don't listen to him. Please, you have to, you have to trust Reno now. Iris? We're on your side. All right then, get on with it. I'll talk. It's the right choice, Dina. Well, it would seem that my learned friend is hell-bent on bringing the entire courtroom down around his ears. So be it. I must confess that I'm struggling to understand what on earth is happening here. Oh, it looks like that disc is on fire. However, it would appear that Mr. McGill has pawned articles on that extraordinary case of the omnibus, are the secrets of which we have been hitherto unaware. So, Mr. Strahd, you will now give your testimony before the court about the events of two months ago. You will reveal the truth, a commodity sorely lacking in your original statements. And this is it, then. Everything's going to come out, like Van Zeek said. This could bring the whole courtroom down around my ears, but as a lawyer, I'm prepared to take that risk. Bring the whole building down. <laughs> Alright. The truth. The truth is, that Brickmaker Cove was in the cabin with the omnibus the whole time. Breakmaker, Mr. Mason. When the Irishman dragged me out from under the seat, I saw that disc on the floor. Okay, the disc was on the floor. All of a sudden, I heard him scream from over me, over me, in that pair on the roof that went off with the cops. That's when Big Gilda slipped it, slipped the driver some tin to do a run to the pawn shop around the belt. He paid the uh, driver to go to the pawn shop. He threatened me not to stitch, not to say nothing to no one about what I'd seen or heard. Grief. This is outrageous. What you just told the court bears almost no resemblance to her testimony two months ago. As you say, my lord. Then, then there's every chance. I may have educated an error in the Gillett's trial. It sounds very much to me as if the man deliberately deceived this court in an effort to cover up the most wicked of schemes. Without doubt, your lordship is correct. Great injustice was done in the courtroom two months ago. 
the actions of the accused in that trial, of this witness, and of my learned friend are, ex are entirely inexcusable. I don't believe it. The whole trial was forced, she was all lies. Let me kill the fellow was right in the court, just like the pickpocket. Don't forget the lawyer from the East, they were all in it together. You're wrong, a lot of you. Mr. Nar Odo, the lawyer there, he didn't know nothing about it. Humbug. I don't think so. Are we really expected to believe that? He really stitched everyone up, didn't he? What an operation to get the man off scot free. Unforgivable, stop. The lies have to stop. Stop. Yes, the defense made a terrible error of judgment. I intend to take full responsibility and suffer whatever consequences are deemed appropriate. However, it's imperative that the court allows the witness to elaborate on her testimony. Because the true significance of McGilded's pond articles must be brought to light. Very well, my learned student friend. Given the depths of calamity you have just plunged yourself into, this may well be worth hearing. Words fail me, and the situation is utterly deplorable. Mr. Narahodo. Yes, my lord? I will decide upon your fate following the conclusion of this trial. Of course, my lord. Blimey, Mr. Narahodo. Now, counsel, proceed with the cross-examination. All right, let's just uh, press and get as much information as we can. That's usually always a good thing to do. And you were hiding in the cabin at the time as well, weren't you, Miss Lestrade? If I remember rightly, in the storage compartment underneath one of the seats. Yeah, that's right. It's pitch black under there, so you can't see nothing at all. Now, in your testimony two months ago, I feel certain you claimed Mr. McGillard was the sole passenger, did you not? False testimony, my lord. That's... that's what he told me I had to say. But it's important that you tell us the truth now. Were Mr. McGilded and the victim acquaintances? I don't know. But I did hear him talking a lot. What were they talking about? Well, I couldn't hear too well, but if I had to say... I think it was about money or something. They kept talking about buying and not buying. Hmm. Perhaps business dealings of some kind? Well, anyway, they got louder and louder. It started to sound like a proper fight. I was pretty scared by then. I hardly dared to breathe, and then, all of a sudden... I heard a noise like someone killed over on the floor. It was blooming loud and all. And I believe you let out an involuntary scream. Yeah. And that's what gave me away. Was the disc you saw this disc? Yeah, I reckon it probably was. It was right next to the cove lying on the floor. Could this disc have belonged to the victim, perhaps? I don't know, but McGilda picked it up pretty smartish. And then he sat the cove with the knife up in his belly up on the seat. And what did he say to you at that time? He told me not to say a word about what I'd seen or heard to no one. About the disc and all. I was dead scared. The way you were looking at me, I thought... If I didn't go along with it, I'd get stuck with that knife, too. Hmm. Then he started asking me a load of questions. Like, what my name was and where I lived in that. He asked me about being a diver, too. But after a while, what happened... What had happened in the carriage was noticed. Yeah, that's right. First there was a kind of rapping noise. Hold it! 
There were two gentlemen occupying the seats on the roof deck, I believe. That's right. <clears throat> they must have looked down through the skylight and noticed the cove with the knife in his guts. When they screamed, the driver pulled up the horses and McGill got me out of sight. Out of sight? Where? I'm back under the seat where I started off. And once the carriage came to a halt, and the two of them closed in the roof, ran out to catch the slops. <clears throat> if they immediately left to fetch the police, it would appear they were entirely unrelated to the incident. Hmm. So that left McGilded, the driver, and you still at the scene. Yeah? Only the driver didn't know I was there because I was under the seat. I heard the cabin door open and a voice from outside. The driver, yes. He also testified in the trial, I believe. A fellow who went by the name of Beppo, if memory serves. What did McGilded and the driver say to each other? I don't know what happened and stuff like that mainly. That pawn shop obviously being Winnie Banks on Baker Street. D just a moment, Counsel. D do you mean to tell me that the driver gave false testimony in that trial as well? Perhaps the excursion to the pawnbrokery slipped his mind when he was in the stand. Indeed, Lord Van Zeeks. Nikola took off, off his coat and gave it to the driver. He pulled it up, all careful like, before handing it over. When I saw him do that, I remember thinking, that coat and what's in it has got to be worth a few bob. Yes, Gina was sure that this must be worth more than Mr. Wingbank was suggesting, wasn't she? I remember her quibbling with him over the price that afternoon at the pawnbrokery. The driver looked pretty happy when McGilda flashed some brass in his face and went off running at a lick. Then the bug troller called me and told me to come out from the drag's cabin. He threatened me not to let you. Hold it! Threatened you how exactly? Told me I'd only be able to scarp her if I did what he said. Which included giving false testimony in court two months ago. Yeah, that's it. There's one other thing he said. Which was. He told me not to hang on to the ticket on the pawn shop. Make sure not to lose it. And the ticket? Well, I never. Said that if he didn't show up to get the ticket off me before two months passed, I had to go to the pawn shop and pay the money to keep it in lug, stop it being forfeited. And left me with some brass to pay for it. But really, why on earth would Mr. McGill have done such a thing? Depositing his overcoat with a pawnbroker before the arrival of, of the police. It makes no sense at all. There seem to be only one logical explanation, my lord. What McGill had had the driver deposit at Winnie Banks was something he didn't want the police to see. Something very important that he needed to hide at all cost. And anyway, after that, he let me go so I it before the copper showed up. Well done, Gina. Can't have been easy to tell the truth like that. Guinea's really put her faith in you, Bruno. Yes, and to thank her, she'll have to face a charge of perjury once this, all, once this trial is over. <laughs> Thanks, Gina. So we need to use the time we have now to get as much information out of her as possible. It's time to really go for it. Press her on every statement. I suppose I should, which is what I just did. Oh, and, oh, and another thing. What's that? Take a look at those two. Isn't it strange that they've been whispering to each other the whole time? Yes, that is strange. It looks like they're having a secret discussion about something. I'm not sure I'm completely comfortable with that. I wonder if there's anything I can do about it. Hmm. Okay, so we need to... 
present some evidence here. But I mean, is there any part of her testimony that would be contradictory? That's reasonable we have evidence. Well, I don't think there's anything that really contradicts anything. Assured with three eyewitness testimonies, I was surprised four witnesses' testimonies resulted in acquittal due to insufficient evidence. Hmm. Is there something you'd like to share with the court, Inspector Gregson and Mr. Graydon? Okay, okay, that's all I had to do. <laughs> well, I wasn't sure if that would work. Inspector's Fish and Chips, Mr. Graydon, and Eggs Benedict. What? what? Blimey, you're trying to give me a heart attack? <laughs> you have been whispering to each other for quite some time now. Tell us, what is, the, what is the discussion about? Remember, you're on the witness stand. Discussion? What, what this fella? What are the other ones, Sunshine? Do you think I've got anything to talk about with a shitty gent like this? Everybody was watching you talk with him. What? <laughs> and I have nothing to say to this uncouth detective after he deprived me of that disc that was rightfully mine. They've clearly been talking the entire time I've been cross-examining Gina. It's as if they've been negotiating. Thank you, Miss Lestrade. Thank you, Counsel. I've heard enough. I believe we now have a reasonable understanding of what exactly what actually transpired on the omnibus. It would appear on that night two months ago, a negotiation was taking place on the Omnibus. A negotiation concerning this disc. However, matters did not run smoothly. When the parties involved began to quarrel over price, McGilded took what he wanted by force. At the expense of the other man's life. Which proves my point, the disc is clearly extremely valuable in some way. 
though I don't understand why it as yet. And two days ago, precisely two months after the Omnibus incident, McGilda's coat and its contents were due to be forfeited. I didn't know what I should do with the ticket. I mean, the Cove died right after his trial. I knew that. So you decided you would try to claim the articles as your own. Well, why not, eh? They're only gonna be forfeited. Why should I have got them? Why shouldn't I have got them? Anyway, you can't blame me for thinking about it. Thinking ain't no crime. Miss Lestrade. It would appear Mr. McGillard was prepared to kill in order to take possession of this disc. Do you know why that would be? Yeah? I ain't got a clue. But I reckon it must be worth a fair bit of brash. He was probably gonna sell it. And you can't blame me for thinking that. Thinking ain't no crime. Hmm. My lord! The evidence your lordship requested has been located and is ready for the court inspection, sir. Hopefully we'll get to take a break here. We're really kind of hungry. Give me a snack. A mysterious little box deposited by McGilded two months ago. There's no doubt in my mind that's a key piece in this far-reaching puzzle. To be continued. Okay, cool. Alright, so the next part should be the finale. So we are just about at the end here. Yeah, okay. It's probably gonna be a long part here, so we'll probably get gear in for a three or four hour stream next time I stream here, so It'll just be Ace Attorney next time. All right, asking me for tonight. I'm getting, like I said, I'm getting kind of hungry here. I want to get a, something to eat here. Thank you for watching. I will continue this. The next next time will be the finale of at least of the Ace Attorney adventures part of this. So, and I can finally begin Spooktober properly here. So, anyway, again, thank you for watching and putting up for this long running <laughs> stream of me doing Ace Attorney here. So. And I will see you next time. Have a good night. Bye-bye.